Everybody, welcome to today's Sunday online at the Free. I'm Michelle and this is Sally and Sally's going to pray for us now. We're going to pray together and I invite you please to join in with the words in bold as they appear on the screen. Grace and, and peace, peace to, to you. you from God who was and is and is to come. Grace, Grace and, and peace, peace to, to you. you from the Holy Spirit who is before God's throne and at work in his church. Grace and peace to you, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the nations of the world will lament before him. Lord, Lord our, our God, God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, who was and is and is to come, the, the Almighty, Almighty One. One. Amen. Amen.
as you may have heard already, we are planning to run two Alpha courses this autumn on a Monday evening and a Wednesday evening. And we would like to challenge you today uh, to consider before God who you should invite to join us for Alpha. We have some little bundles of invites uh, and if you're able to come and pick one of those up from the church uh, and then prayerfully consider who God would like you to give those to. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to share the truth of the gospel uh, with our community and to give people the opportunity to encounter Jesus for themselves. So we'd like to encourage you to do that this week. Hi, Hannah. Hi. It's really good to have you with us this morning. Yeah. So for the last here. couple of years, Hannah has been overseen by our free phase ministry. Um, and Hannah, remind me, what have you been up to, uh, particularly this year? Um, so this last year, I've been up in York, um, working at, or being an intern at uh, St. Michael the Belfry uh, in the centre of York, um, working on the uh, youth team alongside the youth worker and a, a few other interns. Um, I've been doing what's called a leadership year. So last year, some of you may remember, I did a discipleship year here at, in Frinton. Um, so I did the kind of second year to that, which is the leadership year. Um, so I was kind of given a few more responsibilities and it was a bit more um, teaching stuff as well. But it's been a fantastic year. Brilliant. It's good to know you've had a great year. Yeah. And it's taken an exciting development, hasn't it? Yeah. There's new things on the horizon for September. So tell us about that. Yeah, so in September, I will be starting a um, diploma in Christian youth work, um, which I've been saying sounds a lot more fancier than it is, <laughs> um, which will probably entail kind of similar to what I've been doing this last year, um, where I'll be doing a placement at St. Michael the Welfare again, um, but it's all kind of theology stuff taught online um, by Edinburgh Theological Seminary, um, where all the courses are online, so I can stay in York um, to do my studying. That's excellent. So how can we pray for you? Maybe three things that we can pray for over the next yeah. coming year? Um, so um, kind of prayer for um, moving into my new accommodation in September would be great. Um, I've got a few stuff in storage and a few bits at home. So making sure that everything kind of comes together um, at the right time in the right place would be great. Um, prayer for safe travels both up to York and up to Edinburgh as well I think it would be really nice both at the beginning of the year and then at the end of year as well um, and just pray that the course goes really well and that I actually kind of gain something from it um, and just have fun while I'm doing it as well. <laughs> yeah, excellent can I pray for you now? Yeah absolutely. Father thank you so much that despite some of the um, upheaval um, and challenges that this past year has brought, Hannah is able to say that she's had a fantastic year. Uh, I thank you for Hannah's heart of service. I thank you, Lord God, for what you have called her to do at this time. Uh, and looking ahead to September, Father, we want to ask um, for your presence and your peace to be upon Hannah. Um, you've heard what she said this morning. We pray, God, for uh, her accommodation situation and for all the logistics that go with that to go smoothly. Uh, Father, we ask for smooth and safe travel um, to and from uh, both her placement and also up to Edinburgh. We pray that she will enjoy her learning and uh, that, Lord God, she would really grow and flourish over the coming months. We're excited to hear more and to see more of Hannah's journey. Um, and we pray, Lord Jesus, that in everything you would go with her, uh, that you would fill her with your spirit, that you would equip her. And Father God, that again, this time next year, she would be able to testify of your goodness, of a great time and uh, one in which she has grown um, and developed. So, Lord Jesus, we just pray that you would bless her now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's great to hear from Hannah and to see what God has been doing and is continuing to do in her life. And uh, as Michelle mentioned, Hannah is part of the Free Face student ministry here at the church. The aim of Free Face uh, is to enable students who are studying away uh, and those living locally uh, to connect uh, with God and with the church and with each other, to journey uh, with God through this important time in their life and to thrive uh, in their faith and in their life. And uh, there's a team headed up by Michelle uh, which supports the students when they're away. And we asked some of them to send us some feedback uh, on what it's been like for them to be supported 
uh, during their time away as students. We know that Hannah also, she said that she's really appreciated the support that she's received uh, from the team back here when she's been away. A first year student uh, writes this, the help and encouragement I've had from the student group at church has been so amazing in my first year at university. Moving away from home, especially in the middle of a pandemic, was extremely daunting and worrying a lot of the time. So having emails and messages from the team really helped remind me of the support I have at home and from God. A second year student wrote this, they keep in regular contact and it's nice to have a connection with the church when I'm not at home. They send encouraging verses and a rundown of what's going on and it feels really personal. And a third year student wrote this. They've been an absolute dream supporting and praying for me over my time at university. It was always lovely to receive an email from them and what God had revealed to their heart. I will be forever grateful for their continued commitment and devotion, praying for students and their journey with God. That's great to hear. It's really good to know that there is individual testimony of how important it has been to hear from people here at church when our students are away. And we are really keen to grow our student ministry and particularly to grow uh, the part of that ministry that has people who write to um, and keep in contact with our students. So if you would like to be involved in Free Phase, you can pray. Praying is so important and we love the fact that there are a number of you who already do pray for our students. In the coming weeks, these um, leaflets will be circulating around church where you can come to the church office and collect one. This lists the names of all of our students who are away um, and just gives you some prayer pointers on the back for how you might pray for them. If you would like to give an increased commitment to the Free Phase Ministry, we also have these booklets where you can actually pray by name um, for each individual and it also gives you an idea of the things that they would like you to pray for for them, what universities or college courses they are at um, and which year they're in. And then as I said, what we would really love are for a, a few more people to come forward who would be willing to communicate with our students. It doesn't have to be that often once a term, at Christmas, on their birthday, but sending an email, a postcard, a card, things like that, just to let them know that we care um, and that we are thinking and praying for them while they're away. If you think you could do that, please come um, and uh, leave your name at the church office or get in contact with me and I can tell you a little bit more about what that will involve.
Michel Coist, in one of his prayers, wrote a poem called Lord, It Is Dark. Lord, it is dark. Lord, are you here in my darkness? Where are you, Lord? Lord, answer, answer. It is dark. And Heavenly Father, today we want to pray for those who find themselves in darkness, in the darkness of fear, in the darkness of pain, in the darkness of loss. Our hearts and our prayers go out today for the people of Afghanistan, where it would seem the light of progress and hope has gone out. We pray for the people of Haiti, struggling with the aftermath of an earthquake and hurricane without food, shelter and darkness. We pray for the people of Turkey and Greece, whose homes and livelihoods have been decimated by fire. And for the people in Germany and Netherlands facing loss of property and life through the floods. Lord, we pray that in their very dark situations, you would bring light and hope. Father, we pray for all those involved seeking to bring help and support for the humanitarian agencies, for churches, for governments and for individuals, that you would give wisdom, energy and the resources that they need. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that through your death on the cross, you step down into our darkness, but by your resurrection, you bring light, hope, peace, comfort and strength to face all these different situations. And now may we just have a moment of quiet as we bring to God situations that we are aware of, where people feel as though they're in the dark and ask that Lord Jesus, you would bring light and that you would step into their darkness. We ask all these things in the precious and strong name of Jesus. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through to 8, and then verses 17 to 22. So Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Harod. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup the water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands and all the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. Then the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send the others home. So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them home. But he kept the 300 men with him. Then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. 
As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, blow your horns too. All around the entire camp shout for the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hand and the horns in their right hands, and they all shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places as far away as Bethshita near Zerahar and to the border of Abel Menelah near Tabath. Good morning, it's uh, great to be able to share this message with you, which is the next in the series of More Than Enough, and is all about resting in God's grace. But before I bring this message, I'd just like us to pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and the lessons it can teach us. And we pray this morning that as we look at the life of Gideon, that it will help us on our journey here in 2021. Father, through your Holy Spirit, may the message from your word be a light into our path and a light into our lives. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The, the passage that Michelle's just read to us, isn't that the most amazing story? It's one of my favourites from the Old Testament where Gideon, with 300 soldiers, manage, manages to overcome a combined army believed to be in the order of 135,000 troops. And amazingly, this was a victory achieved without drawing a sword. Here, Gideon's 300 warriors surround the valley where the Midianites are camped. They shine lights, blow trumpets and shout. And as a result, the army flees in utter disarray, only to be pursued and harassed by Gideon and his allies. In a later assault, Gideon's exhausted troops complete the destruction of these combined foreign armies. It's a great story and one I remember being taught by my parents and Sunday school teacher. And I think it has all the elements of a really good film. Good triumphing over evil, the underdog is victorious and justice is seen to be done. However, this triumphant victory is not the beginning of Gideon's story, nor is it the end. The end of Gideon's story comes in Judges chapter 8 verse 32, which says, Gideon son of Joash, died at a good old age and he was buried in the tomb of his father. And just before that, in verse 28, we are told because of the changes Gideon had brought about, that during Gideon's lifetime, the land enjoyed 40 years of peace. So what had Gideon managed to do to bring about peace in a time of overwhelming oppression? The answer is surprisingly simple, but perhaps not unexpected. He had an encounter with God, and as is so often the case, it was not an encounter in what we might describe as a church setting. He was at work, trying to ensure his family had food to eat at a time when food was hard to come by. He was in a difficult place, threshing wheat in a wine press. Now threshing requires a breeze to blow away the chaff, not very likely in a wine press. Doing it this way made it twice as difficult and half as productive, but needs must, such was the oppression by the Midianites. And we're going to look at chapter 6, and in the beginning of that chapter, in verses 2 and 4, it says this, 
Because the power of the Midians was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. You know, the power of the Midianites meant Israel were unable to farm in the way they would like. They were in a really difficult situation. And it was only when the, when the Midianites had continually impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And, it, and is so, as is so typical with God, he responded by sending a prophet who brought this reminder in verse 8. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the land of all your oppressors. I drove them before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. However, God had listened to his people and given them exactly what they wanted, freedom to worship the God of the Amorites. And as ever, there were and always will be consequences when we don't listen to God. The consequences for the nation had not gone on for seven years. Seven years of oppression and hardship. Nowhere to call home. No safety or security and certainly no peace. So this brings us to Gideon's encounter with God while at work. And I think we need to redefine here what work is. Work for many is seen as that which we get paid to do. But I think that's a far too narrow definition and leaves much to be desired. And I think a far better definition of work is this, that work is the form in which we make ourselves useful to others. And thereby, at a stroke, we are released from the construct of work being something that we are paid to do. You suddenly can acknowledge that despite perhaps retirement or unemployment, you can still, through work, be useful to others. You know, we have no idea whether Gideon was thinking about God, praying, or simply grumbling about his plight. But God, at this time, and in his amazing grace, turns up and through his angel speaks these words, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Not just a warrior, but a mighty warrior. Now Gideon would have known of the song of Moses and Miriam from Exodus 15 verse 3, where they say the Lord is a warrior, and read the exploits of Nimrod, described as a mighty warrior in Genesis 10. He knew what a warrior was, but I think from the situation Gideon was in, we can be fairly sure he didn't feel like a warrior, and certainly not like a mighty warrior. But that was how God saw him and defined him. Sometimes I think we need to try and see ourselves as God sees us, which will allow us to fulfil our potential. Remember last week's message, where Claire reminded us that Mephibosheth saw himself as a dead dog, whereas God through David saw him as an heir to his father's estate. Ian reminded us that God saw the Samaritan woman not as an outcast, but someone to be loved. Aubrey reminded us that, uh, that God saw Zacchaeus not as a tax collector, but as a friend. And Mark reminded us that God saw David not as a shepherd, but as a king. All were recipients of God's overwhelming grace. And perhaps here, Gideon's response is typical and most likely to be ours in the circumstances. And it is a questioning question. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders our fathers told us about when they said the Lord brought us out of Egypt? You know, despite the tone of Gideon's reply, God's view does not change. He says to Gideon, Go in the strength you have and save 
Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? You know, in reading this verse, I'm fascinated by the words that the angel of the Lord uses. The angel doesn't say go in the strength of God or the strength of the Lord or in the strength that will be provided for you. He simply says go in the strength you have. Oh, and by the way, save a nation. God knew what Gideon was capable of achieving in the same way he knows what we are capable of achieving. We need to remember that humanity has the capacity to achieve the amazing, if not the seemingly impossible. You may remember in Genesis chapter 11 that God came to earth to view the building of a tower that was planned to reach heaven. And he says in verse 5, as if one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And this is God speaking after observing his own creation, us, humanity. I find this verse staggering and often wonder what our world would have been like if Adam and Eve had not fallen. When humanity decides to work together, then achieving the impossible becomes possible. And I would venture to suggest that over the last 18 months, humanity around the globe has united in its attempts to provide solutions to the threat of a catastrophic worldwide pandemic. You know, throughout this passage in Judges chapter 6, there is an ongoing seesaw conversation between the angel of God and Gideon. On the one hand, Gideon, God tells Gideon what he can achieve. And on the other, Gideon questions and seeks reassurance. To each positive statement from God, Gideon responds with a question or a negative statement. Three times in six verses, Gideon finds it really difficult to accept the positive words from the angel. Finally, Gideon asks for a sign and proposes that he prepare an offering and bring it to the angel. Graciously, the, the angel agrees and Gideon goes about preparing a goat, baking a loaf and eventually presenting it. And it's at this point that something truly miraculous happens, in that the offering is consumed by a fire coming from a rock. And it's at this point that the angel disappears. Just imagine how Gideon felt. He'd brought his offering, he placed it on a rock and it had been consumed and at exactly the same time the angel had disappeared. But Gideon at this moment of extreme, has a moment of extreme clarity when he realises he has been talking to the sovereign God and he's scared for his life. But again, the Lord is gracious and says to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon was grappling with this whole saga throughout this chapter. The angel having appeared to him under a tree, the challenge that he was going to be a mighty warrior, and then at the end he's fearful for his life. And as if this encounter with the angel of the Lord wasn't enough, the Lord appears to Gideon again that night and asks Gideon to tear down his father's altar to Baal along with the Asherah pole and to build a proper kind of altar. You know, this encounter marks a significant change. God is asking Gideon to act now rather than just to think. You know, listening to God will always require a response. And here the Lord is asking Gideon to challenge his father, the wider family and his clan. His actions to follow the Lord's instructions involved ten of his servants who went with him and cut down the Asherah pole and built an altar and sacrificed a seven-year-old bull. You know, Gideon, because he was fearful of the response, did this at night. And as he predicted, the townsfolk became a mob and ultimately demanded he must die. Interestingly, despite having cut down and destroyed his father as altar, it was his father who defended Gideon in front of that angry crowd. You know, despite the fact there was no, no email, mobile phones or even Morse code, this action by Gideon brought a swift response from the Midianites, the Amalekites and other eastern peoples. 
they joined forces and crossed over the River Jordan and camped in the Valley of Jezreel. Their intent was to destroy Gideon and the remnant of Israel. At this time, when Gideon was most likely to be terrified, the Spirit of the Lord rested on Gideon. Just when Gideon needed God, he turned up. And instinctively, God knew what to do. And instinctively, Gideon, sorry, knew what to do, to summons help. So he blew his trumpet and sought help from across the tribes. And surely that's an example for us all. We can't do it all on our own. Even when, God, even when Gideon had the Spirit of God with him, he still needed help from those around him to fulfil God's plans. Just because God is with us does not automatically mean we can do it all on our own. When we need help, we should ask. In the latter part of this chapter, it is Gideon who initiates the conversation with God and asks for a sign or confirmation that God intended Gideon to save Israel. He lays out a fleece and asks God for the ground to be dry and the fleece to be wet with dew. And when that happens, he boldly asks God to confirm his confirmation by reversing the situation and make the ground wet and the fleece dry. How gracious is God to Gideon. How patient is God with Gideon. God so loves his people, he is prepared to listen, to wait and to act by reassuring his servants. So we arrive back where this message started. Gideon and his 300 warriors defeating the joint armies numbering over 135,000. Sadly, there's not enough time this morning to walk through the story of Gideon as found in Judges chapters 6, 7 and 8. So please, during this week or maybe later today, find the time, find 10 or 15 minutes to read these chapters through and immerse yourself in the life lessons to be learnt from Gideon's interaction with God. So in conclusion, what has happened as a result of God finding Gideon while at work? Firstly, God changed how Gideon saw himself. Secondly, God changed how the nation saw Gideon. And thirdly, Gideon changed how the nation saw God. You know, any encounter with God brings about change. While many find it difficult, others thrive. Remember when Gideon cut down the Asherah pole and destroyed the altar, the people were up in arms. They wanted Gideon's life. Despite the fact that the nation was in a mess, the people didn't want to change. They wanted things to remain as they were. And we currently live in a time when the future is uncertain. As a world, we're walking through times none of us have experienced before. Nothing will ever quite be the same, either in our country, our society, or perhaps our church. We have undergone changes that none of us could have accurately predicted. And although the future is in God's hands, we don't know what that future looks like. Gideon's encounter with God changed how Gideon saw himself and ended the nation's seven years of oppression and brought about 40 years of peace and prosperity. We can be certain that God has not and never will change, but my venture to suggest that God may be asking us to become more like Gideon. He wanted Gideon to change so that through him, God could bring blessing to his nation. Perhaps God this morning wants us to see ourselves as he sees us, so we might partner with him and change our culture, our community and our nation. What through his grace is God saying to our world or our community and maybe particularly to us? Is he challenging us to be more loving, tolerant, understanding, giving, patient, hospitable? welcoming, thankful, or simply obedient. Because we're not yet perfect, change is an integral part of the journey called faith, to become more like Christ, to have his heart of compassion, both for those who don't know him and also for those who as yet don't fully grasp who they are to be in Christ. You know, perhaps this morning the very thought of change brings about anxiety, 
fear or a simple rejection of this message. But we need to remember that while the world around us changes, God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And as I was writing that line earlier, I rem remember singing this chorus, Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. I said earlier, nothing will ever change God. So whatever God may be saying to each one of us, we can be assured that we can fully rest in God's perfect grace and that his grace is more than enough to see us journey safely into our eternal future. And as we draw to the end of our service this morning, we're going to uh, stand and sing together that song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. May we all be reassured by God's presence. May we realise that his grace is more than enough, despite what the future may hold. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us today in our worship. And just a quick reminder about Alpha, uh, to be praying about if God wants to, uh, you to invite anyone uh, and to pick up some of those cards. Michelle is going to read to us now as we close. Let's join together in the wonderful words of Psalm 23. Whatever you're doing right now, just relax your mind and your body and just submit yourself to God as you listen to these words and allow the presence of his spirit to come upon you and to minister to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honour to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honour me by anointing my head with oil, my cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness, God, and your unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen.